we need a Dr. Ed here saying hallelujah. Praise God. So good to see you all tonight on a beautiful Wednesday night. And I'm so glad you're here. And we got a lot to talk about tonight. So get that microphone ready and we're going to do a lot of discussion. This is the reason we have these Bible studies. It's not for me just to stand up here and talk to you. I want you to learn, right? If you're not learning anything, then we're not doing our job. Remember, the main purpose of the church was to educate. You go back and study the book of Acts. It's always educating the people the truth of God's word so that they can in turn educate others. And that's what Ephesians chapter 4 is all about, that we all come to the knowledge of truth. We want to come to that place where we can proclaim the truth of God's word and love. Welcome to the Look Up and Lift Up Your Heads Prophecy Watchers Bible Study that meets every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And we're glad you are with us tonight. We will not be having Bible study next Wednesday night. That is Thanksgiving Eve. Please enjoy your family. Get ready to stuff yourself, if that's what you're going to plan on doing. Um, but no Wednesday night Bible study next Wednesday night, which is December, or excuse me, is uh, the 24th. So please, we'll be back here on December 1st, okay? Back here on December 1st, and we will continue our Bible studies. Now, we hope to be in the Education Center on December 1st, and we will have refreshments for you, and uh, um, we'll have a, a more of a relaxed place over there, and we're gonna have a lot of discussion. So um, this coming Sunday, we will be in the Education Center for a video on the DNA of the giants, the Nephilim. And uh, I want you to see that after we did that Bible study on the truth about Noah's Ark, you need to see, see this very vital information that's brought forth. Uh, Satan wants to hide the truth of what really took place in the days of Noah. And uh, that it has everything to do with Satan, corrupt, uh, Satan or the fallen angels corrupting the DNA of man. And this is what's going on again. It's happening before our very eyes. You're going to see a, a, a um, complete DNA corruption soon. It's going to be part of the uh, program, I believe, that the Antichrist is going to introduce. And it's going to cause people to live longer. They will want to live longer, but at the same time, it will totally cause them to forfeit any chance of being saved, as the Word of God says. Once they take that mark, forfeit any chance of being saved. Okay? So this coming Sunday, we'll be over in the Education Center at 10 a.m. They will be setting up for the concert here, Sounds of Joy concert with Jennifer Bennett. will be taking place around 11, uh, 20 or so. And once we get through our first parts of our service, we will have praise and worship, and then she will take it from there. She'll be singing, and she'll be testifying we want you to invite family and friends. We want to bless her. This is her ministry, so please come out and let's bless her with our not only our attendance, but with a good love offering that is this coming Sunday, the 21st. Following that, we will be having a meeting and lunch for all those who will be taking part in the December 19th activities, okay? So if you want to be part of that any way, shape, or form, see Sister Donna, and she'll get you into in the, uh, the program, okay? Amen? Are we good? Tonight's lesson, the false hyper grace gospel. How many of you ever heard of the hyper grace gospel? The false hyper grace gospel that is being taught in many churches by wolves in sheep's clothing. I want you to see this. This is what we put on Facebook. License to sin. We all carry our own license around for driving or an identification. Literally, the hyper grace gospel, as you're going to learn, is giving people, people who claim to be Christians, the license to live in sin. And as you can see, the lady's name is Mia First. And that's, that's basically their teaching. It's all about you. It's all about you. Okay. So let's, uh, let's pray and ask God's blessing tonight before we get into tonight's study. Are you ready? Have your Bibles ready? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that you've given us another Wednesday night to study your word. Lord, we know we live in very dangerous times. It's, there's never been a day like the day where we have so much corruption, not only in our country, but in the church. 
And as our brother Ken said tonight, he, he, he said that uh, Donnie Swigert made a statement that most of the church in America is married to the devil, and that is true. Most of the church is not walking with Jesus, but they are holding hands with the evil one, the fallen one. They're listening to his lies and his deceptions, and they don't care to find out the truth. Heavenly Father, help us here at Abundant Life Fellowship. We want to be that remnant church that's all about truth. We want to make disciples. We want to walk with you. We want to proclaim the truth. We want to live in a way that honors you. So, Lord, tonight, help us to do that. Teach us by the power of your spirit. Help us to learn. And, Lord, not only that we would learn the truth, but proclaim it as well. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's children said. Say it with me. Amen and amen and amen. Amen. Um, at first, I was going to just try to finish up the, the final four Gospels tonight. And the more I studied on this, the more I said, my, this one here is going to take some time. Because it is very dangerous. It's one of the most dangerous, if not the dangerous. As, as we studied about the false prosperity gospel last Wednesday night, and as dangerous as that gospel is, this one is too. And if anyone's following the hyper-grace gospel, as we're going to see, they are not saved. They do not have the truth in them. They are bound for hell. And, and I will tell you right now, that's most of the church. The hyper-grace gospel is not something that's new. It's been around for a while. But it's really taken off within the last decade under the uh, disguise of churches calling themselves seeker-friendly. How many ever heard of seeker-friendly churches or emerging churches, uh, which basically tell people, you know, God loves you just the way you are and you don't have to change and we'll get into all that. But I want you to know tonight there are people running to these types of churches. If they're, it, 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 anytime the, the message of the church is about you or about people, about them being blessed, that's going to attract the crowd. Okay, that's just automatic. And I remember several years ago, there was a guy who confronted me because he was, I was teaching against this, and he said, well, what kind of style is your church? What kind of style? And I said, our Abundant Life Fellowship is all about doing the will of God, and that is to make disciples, which is clearly detailed in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. We're all about making disciples by teaching the true word of God, teaching the truth, calling people to repentance, calling people to follow Christ. And he says, well, what do you mean by that, following Christ? And I said, by walking in holiness, righteousness, and godliness. And he says, well, he said, don't you think you're being judgmental? Don't you think you're being judgmental by saying those kind of things, judgmental? In other, other words, what he was saying is, I don't want to hear anything that's going to upset my way of doing things. See, when people say a pastor is being judgmental by calling people to walk in holiness, righteousness, and godliness, which is what God's word teaches, then they think you're being judgmental of them if they're not being holy, righteous, and godly. The thing is, you and I have to come to understand is, if you are hearing the truth of God's word, you've got to judge yourself. You've got to judge yourself all of the time. Now, I can't judge you, okay? I mean, I can't, I don't know your heart. I, I can see what people are doing on the outside, okay? But we are all to judge ourselves. Now, last week, we talked about Ephesians 5.11. We are to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them or expose them. Does everybody understand that? We are never to have anything to do with any church or any Christian or any pastor or any teacher that is proclaiming a false gospel or proclaiming false doctrines. But I want to draw your attention to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Look at this now. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. In order to examine yourself, you have to judge yourself. So when people say, I don't like it if a preacher is preaching the word of God, and it comes across as judgmental. I remember him saying, this, this certain individual saying, people are hurting, and they're being, they're, they're just too much judgmentalism going on, and people are hurting, they don't need to hear any more, uh, don't need to be judged any further. And my answer to that is, we must judge ourselves if you're hurting or not. Come on. Yeah. If you want to find peace, 
If you want to find joy in this life, it's not going to come by people tolerating your ways or condoning your ways, regardless if they're sinful or not. The only way you're going to find peace and joy in this life is coming to Jesus Christ and, and, and coming to the foot of the cross and getting saved, and then the Holy Spirit will give you joy and peace. Come on. But in order for you to have that, you've got to judge yourself first and foremost as a sinner. And then after that, you receive Christ as your Savior, and you follow him as Lord. And from that time on, God's word does judge you. God's word comes forth, and it does shine a big spotlight on your life. And the Lord will show you the things you need to get rid of so you can follow Christ. Come on. Now, if you don't like that, that's because you don't want to follow Jesus. After all he's done for you on the cross, suffering, bleeding, and dying for you, um, what's the word of God say? That we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, which is our reasonable act of service or worship, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. That's the least we can do, right? So we are to examine ourselves as to whether we are in the faith. Notice the word of God says, in the faith. It doesn't say, examine to see if you have a faith. There are a lot of faiths. You have to examine to see if you are in the faith, the true faith. If you truly are believing the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Or are you listening to and following a different gospel? And then the word of God says, Paul says, test yourself. Test yourself. How do we know if we are really in the faith or not? Do you not know? Paul answers that question. Do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you? There's your answer. If you are in the faith, you are going to walk like Christ walked. You're going to be conformed to his image. Do you see that? You're going to abide in Christ, and your life is going to be transformed. You're going to begin to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Come on. You're going to see fruit begin to grow. Now, once again, I am not saying you're going to have an overnight transformation. Nobody has that. I've been saved... 44 years, and believe me, I'm just getting going. Come on. All right? I'm not trying to put anything on somebody and say, boy, you've got to straighten up overnight. But when the Lord's word comes forth, you've got to deal with it. When light comes, when the light comes into darkness, how you handle that light is going to determine what you do with Jesus. Can someone shout amen? Now, unless indeed you have been, are disqualified. Let me tell you, disqualified means you are lost. There are a lot of people that are lost that are going to church. There are people right now that go to church every Sunday that are not going to be with Christ because they have never come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They're false converts. They are listening to false gospels as we're going to hear tonight. Okay? All right, does anybody have any questions on 2 Corinthians 13.5? All right, do you understand that we must examine ourselves? And it's like, you, you know, we, we take time to examine our physical life. Um, I know women are told to examine certain parts of their body, you know, and if you see something on your body, if you see a growth or if you, you see a lump or something or, you know, or if you have a, a, a cough or something, you examine yourself, you know, that's a little concerning because that shows there might be something physically wrong. But that's not the important thing. What's important is if there's something spiritually wrong. You want to do a physical examination, sure. You want to make sure you're healthy. But what's the most important examination you and I are to do every day? We need to see if we are in the faith, the true faith, walking with Christ daily. Yes, brother. Yeah. Um, but staying with that scripture where you're at right now, um, we have to make sure our faith is not in, in other things. Absolutely. In other words, sometimes where our faith is in water baptism, our, our, our baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking with other tongues, or church attendance, or my giving, or my prayer life, or my Bible study. And those things are good of, in and of themselves, but that doesn't, not, that doesn't that save you. No. Those no, are things no, no. that we those should are do. That, yeah. Those are results of our salvation, but it's not the cause for our salvation. Right. So uh, we have to make sure our faith is in, in not those things that we do 
or what or our, our faith in our church or our preacher or anything else it has to be in christ and him crucified and that and that alone you got to be faith that's got to be on the cross exactly right. and that's yeah, what i mean what yeah. christ did on the cross right, right. so yeah. people say well i go to church every sunday well that's like you said it's not mm -hmm. in church attendance but right. it's it's in where where does it lie is your faith right. in that what you do or is it what he's already done right right so, absolutely that's yeah. right on thank you for that okay so um once again we talked about we must expose the unfruitful works of darkness if we are in the faith if we are truly in the faith and we are following christ as the lord god has declared if we are walking with the lord we're going to not tolerate anything that's false we're not going to have anything to do with it see we got people right now they get that they, this study tonight, I don't want to hear anything about that. I don't care what people believe. They have the, the mindset, doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter how you act, as long as you believe in God, you believe in Jesus, you're good. And that is one of Satan's grandest lies. Okay, hell's going to be full of people who claim to be Christians. There are going to be people in hell with church membership applications. Uh, they're going to have uh, uh, baptismal waters on their forehead, all that. None of that's going to matter unless you're in the faith, right? Okay. Now, because this is so important, I want to revisit it because there are a lot of people in church that don't understand what the true gospel is. Now, I know most of you probably do, but if you were to tell somebody what the true gospel is, how would you define it? And how would you know if you're hearing the true gospel or a false gospel? Now, once again, let's go through this very quickly. What is the gospel? Let's just say it out. What is the true gospel? What is it? It's the good news that what? That Jesus does what? Save. Saves. Saves us from what? Our sins. Okay. So the answer, it is the good news to every person worldwide, for it provides the answer to our greatest need as depraved sinners, remember, which is salvation from our sins. Okay? That's it. That's it, salvation from our sins. Without that, there is no gospel, all right? And we talked about that for the last two Sunday nights. The one true gospel clearly declares six truths to everyone. Does anybody want to take a stab at that for a few minutes? Remember, there's six truths that the true gospel declares that are absolutely from God's word. Scripture after scripture after scripture. What's the first thing it must do? It must what? It, okay, number one, that every person is a depraved sinner and is lost with no hope of saving oneself. That's the first thing. The gospel clearly teaches that we cannot save ourselves. We are depraved sinners and we are lost. What's another one? What's another one that the, teaches us? We need a savior, right? We need a savior. Number two, the penalty of our sin is eternal death, which is hell, also known as the lake of fire. That not only are we depraved sinners, but we're hellbound. Number three, as our brother said, the penalty of sin must be paid in full, but none of us can pay for our own sins and earn our salvation. So that takes away any gospel, as we are going to learn, that declares good works. You and I cannot earn our salvation. Not if we do it for a trillion years. Now, once again, I'm not saying good works aren't important. They are. The Bible teaches we are to have good works, but good works are a result of salvation. They do not precede salvation. Does everybody understand that? Let me say that again. Good works are a result of our salvation because only Christ can do that in us. Okay? The Holy Spirit is transforming us. It's not the... It doesn't precede our salvation, it's the results. As we often say, it is not the root of our salvation, but it's the fruits of our salvation. Number four, the, the fourth thing that the one true gospel declares is the penalty for our sins was paid in full by Jesus who willingly laid down his life to suffer and shed his blood on the cross. On the cross. Say that with me. On the cross. Nowhere else. All right, so when you hear these false teachers say, oh, Jesus, this, this death on the cross meant nothing. He had to go down in hell, and there, he, there is where he, he really paid for our sins. That is a lie. That is false doctrine. And if you believe that, you are believing in a different Jesus. And yet, there are millions upon millions upon millions who believe that lie 
tonight, they go to the big church in town. They go to other ch churches. Word of faith churches teach it, most of them. Word of faith. That Christ's death on the cross meant nothing. He had to suffer in hell. Now, they have to teach that because they teach the little God's doctrine. See, Christ had become born again in hell. He took upon the nature of Satan to be born again so we can take upon the nature of God. That's one of their teachings. Okay? And that is a lie. I mean, remember what Satan's goal is, is to corrupt the true gospel, right? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, I, I think they do. They capitalize on the resurrection, but it's only because they teach that while Christ was in hell being tormented, it was there that God said, okay, enough is enough, you know, and let Jesus out of there. Right. Yeah. But he couldn't raise from the dead unless he first went to the cross and paid the price because right. the wages of sin, if he failed to atone for one sin, then there would be no resurrection. Right. And brother, let yeah. me tell you something. The moment you say that it, the cross was not where Christ paid for our salvation, you have a false Jesus. And I'm telling you, it's sad that I have family that believe that lie. And I told them, I'm sorry, I'll never see you once we depart. from. You will always be internally in hell. Because they follow Copeland, they follow Jesse Duplantis, they follow Joyce Myers, they follow those people that teach false doctrines. Okay? And they run to churches like Meadowbrook that also accept those false doctrines because it's appealing to their flesh. And it's sad tonight, brother and sister, those people, they think they're saved. You can't have the Holy Spirit residing in you. You cannot have the Holy Spirit residing in you if you are listening to those kind of lies, especially when there are no scriptures for that. I challenge people, show me in scripture where Jesus did not pay for our sins on the cross, shedding his holy blood. Where in the word of God does it say he suffered and died and, and, or suffered and paid for our, our sins in hell? There's not one verse in the Bible. Not one. Without taking something clearly out of context. Number five, salvation for our sins is a free gift. Free gift. Now, offered by God, given by his grace. Now, we need to understand that because tonight we're going to talk about God's grace. There is a difference between God's grace and hyper grace okay but this also to totally disqualifies if you are roman catholic because roman catholic teaches that they believe in god's grace but they also teach that you have to add works in there in order to be saved which is totally denying the sufficiency of God's grace because if God's grace is a gift how can you earn your salvation if salvation is a gift and as you and I know the word of God clearly teaches us that for God what did he do all have sinned and come short of the glory of God but the gift of God is eternal life what through Jesus Christ our Lord gift of God if it's you have to work for it it's not a gift amen and finally, six, although salvation is a free gift, it can only be received by our faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. So the, our faith has to be in there. And if you truly have faith in that, that's where you're going to be transformed. You truly believe you're going to be transformed. Amen. Does everybody see that? So we talked about the four ingredients. We're going to go through this very quickly because... Every time you listen to someone preaching and teaching, you've got to use this four ingredients. See, what are they really presenting? The four, four key ingredients of the one true gospel. Number one, the gospel exposes our greatest problem, which is being eternally, eternally lost due to our sinful depravity with no hope of saving ourselves. Okay, so the true gospel literally exposes our greatest problem, our sins, right? Our greatest problem is not our health, our greatest problem is not our wealth. We don't, see, listen, you can be dirt poor, and that's not your greatest problem. Your greatest, you can be sick. You can, you can have one, one problem after another in your body, and that's not your greatest problem. Our greatest problem is not emotional. Our greatest problem is not social problems, right? But our greatest problem is being lost due to sin. Brother David, could you turn this down just a tad, just a tad? I think I'm getting a little bit of ringing up here. Number two. The gospel brings to light the answer to our sin problem, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. There it is. There is our answer, right? 
Jesus never came to give us a better life here and now, as Mr. Osteen teaches and many of the false teachers. And he never came to give us health and wealth, but he came to bring salvation for our sins. Christ came to seek and to save the lost. Number three, the gospel offers us the gift of eternal life, salvation through God's grace alone, not by any of our works. As sinners, we are justified by faith, by believing the gospel message, resulting in following Christ as Lord. And then finally, number four, if you are truly receiving the true gospel, the gospel transforms us who were once sinful and lawless men and women to live a life of righteousness and godliness so that we obey and follow Christ as his disciples. Because when you truly receive the true gospel and you understand what Christ has done for you and you repent of your sins, you're going to give your life to Christ. And the Holy Spirit's going to take resident in you and he's going to transform you. That is what he does. And it's an honor. It's a privilege to follow Christ, no matter how tough it is. Okay? It's an honor and a privilege to follow the one who shed his blood, who suffered so that we may have eternal life. True born-again believers no longer practice sin, but live for Christ as we proclaim the one true gospel to everyone we can. Now, you're going to find out tonight this is very important. This last point is very important because what we are about to study. All right, are we ready? Once again, Romans 1, 16 through 17, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for what? For prosperity? Is it for prosperity? How about for social issues? Huh? Is it for our, is it for our health? No, it's for what? Read it. For it is the power of God for, to what? Salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. For it is righteousness of God, is, for it in it the righteousness of God, in it the righteousness of God, look at that, is revealed from faith to faith. Now what does that mean? The righteousness of God. What's that mean? Hand him that microphone. See, not only you believe, but something's going to happen. What's going to happen if you truly believe the true gospel? We were right with him. You're right with him. Yeah. You're right with God. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and his righteousness is being produced in you. Um, he declares you righteous. He gives us uh, uh, his sinlessness. He takes our sinfulness. Right. If I, if I remember correctly, that's what the burnt offerings stood all in the Old Testament, all those burnt offerings they took. Yeah. That's what they yeah. represented. Yeah. So his righteousness is imputed to us. We did not do anything other than believe. All right. Isn't that neat? Wow. God did it all. That's why it's the, the sufficiency on the cross. So a love for the gospel results in obedience to God's will. Amen. And how many tonight say, I want to obey him. I want to honor the Lord. Okay, so we, this is where we pick up tonight's lesson. Okay, so once again, a warning against false gospels. There are many false gospels. We're only going to deal with five in this series. We've already dealt with one, the false prosperity gospel. If you did not get to hear that, uh, it's on um, Facebook now and, and on YouTube, on our Facebook and on our, and YouTube. Okay, once again, the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 1.9, If any man is preaching another gospel, let him be accursed. If anyone is preaching anything than what the one true gospel proclaims, that man or that woman, in God's eyes, will be accursed. And this is why, brother and sister, I teach and preach the way I do, and I use a lot of scriptures. Because there was a time I didn't preach the true gospel. There was a time where I preached a false gospel and there was a time when I really really thought it was going to get me somewhere until all because of God's wonderful grace and mercy I begin to see the error and it's like this it's just like I heard the the, the master's voice that come out from among them now, I didn't hear it audibly it's just like inside of me get away from that stuff get away from it um, when I was attending word of faith churches and I would go in, and every time I'd go in this one church, I just felt uneasy. I said, there's something wrong here. It just felt fleshy. I felt dirty. I felt something was spiritually wrong. 
And nobody else felt that. I mean, there might have been some others, but I, just like, this is wonderful. And hearing this pastor get up and say personal prophecies and all, I said, man, that just stuff doesn't, where is this in the Word of God? But, of course, I was thinking, that well, and there's got to be some reason for it, and it's got to be from God. But when I came to a point where I finally came to the stark realization that the sufficiency of scriptures, that, it, that all we need is the word of God. If you go outside, see, if you go outside the word of God, you're going to be deceived. Anytime you say, well, yeah, the Bible's true, but we need extra revelation, then you're going to be deceived. But when you come to a point where you say this book is all we need, this is the all sufficient word of God. And that's when I begin to make judgments on this stuff and say, well, listen, this is not, what they're doing is not in the Word of God. I don't care how many times they say, God showed me, God appeared to me, God said to me. It doesn't matter. Anyone can do that. I don't care how many times they got slain in the Spirit and rolled in the aisles. If it's not in the Bible, and I finally came to the point, so I don't want anything to do with it anymore. And let me tell you, there are a lot of people that branded me as a troublemaker, as a rebel, or you just, you're just not, you're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit. How many of you heard that? You're just, you're just not sensitive to the things of God. You got too much of the natural man in you, not enough of the Spirit. All these nonsense. And I said, if, if this is what it takes to be sensitive to God, to be like you, then I don't want to be sensitive to God. <laughs> okay, I want to do nothing but the truth. Come on. But they're not sensitive to God. Believe me, it's not the Holy Spirit that's doing the work in them. It's a different spirit. So, all right. So tonight, the false hyper-grace gospel that is being taught in many churches by the wolves in sheep's clothing. All right, are you ready? So before we learn what the hyper-grace gospel is, let's once again revisit the true meaning of what is God's grace very quickly. Give me a one-sentence answer. What is the grace of God? Okay, God's unmerited favor. It means God's unmerited and unearned favor. God's grace means you and I did not earn it. It was given to us. That's why it is part of his gift. God's grace gives us the gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus. Amen. You and I can't earn it. All right. So let's look at Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, rich in mercy, abounding in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. How many know that was all of us? We were all dead. I mean spiritually dead. You were dead, hellbound. I was dead and hellbound. In our trespasses, in our sinfulness, he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. Someone shout amen. That ought to make you shout to the highest parts of your lungs. Come on. Right there. Amen. All right. Verse 6 and 7. And he raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we're raised with Christ. And one day that's going to be a realization. Come on. When we're with Christ. That in the ages to come. Now get this. That in the ages to come. That he, the Lord God, might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Verse 8. For by grace you have been Faith. saved through what? Faith. Faith, not by works. It's not of yourselves, not because of who you are, no matter how wonderful or how good looking you might be or how talented you might be. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. That means you and I cannot pound our, ch our chest and say, look what I did. Anything we have, anything we can do, any gifts and talents is all because of Jesus. There cannot be any pride in the true believer's life. Come on. Whatever you accomplish in this life, it's only because God gave you the ability to do so. Verse 10, for we are his what? Uh-oh, he, think about that. We are his workmanship. That means he does all the work. See, it's God who's working in us. It's the Lord God who's working in us because of his grace created in Christ Jesus for what kind of works? Any works we want to do, right? Good works according to who? According to God's word, God torn to God, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, God predestined us to walk in them. 
He knew what good works we were going to do. And now think about it. Just being here tonight is a good work. He knew you would be here before you were even born. Does that blow your mind? He knew Ken was going to share tonight what he shared from before he was even conceived in his mother's womb. He knew Donna was going to do the skit back when Apostle Paul was preaching. I mean, it just blows my mind. God is that amazing. And I think about it. So everything that you and I will ever do, God knew we would do it. Anything we do that he's created for us to do beforehand. Now, we know what God's grace is. It's his unmerited favor. It's all about what Christ did for us on the cross, that God gave us his grace, right? All right. Now, the word hyper, as we're going to learn tonight, the word hyper means to go beyond that. It goes beyond to be fanatical or to be obsessive. Concerning hyper grace, it means to go beyond the true meaning of God's grace to teach a false grace not taught in Scripture. Because what does God's, very quickly, what does God's true grace do for you and I? What does it do for you and I? Besides, it's, he saves us, but what does it also do? There we go. It, wants, it causes us to want to live a life of holiness for him. You see, once again, we did not earn any of our salvation. Not one second. When you and I are with Christ in all eternity, not one second of that eternity was earned by you or me. Not one second. Not even a half a second. Everything was done through Christ by God's grace. And that should cause you and I to want to live for him. See, if you understand that, you are not going to live for self like most of the church is. You're not going to seek God for a best, blessed life now. You're not going to say, God, I want a better car. I'm, I'm claiming this brand new car. I'm claiming more money. I'm claiming a, a $60 million jet so I can fly around and, and look like I'm really something. No. Instead, if you're going to claim anything, you're going to claim that, Lord, help me to surrender my life to serve you. Amen? So the hyper-grace gospel is taught by many popular television preachers. Now, if I named them all, we'd be here for an hour. Such as Joel Osteen, Joseph Prince. Joseph Prince is one of the biggest ones. Steve Furtnick. How many heard of Steve Furtnick? Uh, Rick Warren and many others. And it's also being taught in many growing churches. And they all teach that God has eradicated believers from any accountability for their sinful conduct on the basis of of the finished work of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you are a born-again believer, you don't have to do anything. You're just basically saved by grace, live your life the way you want. Now, let me give you some points on that. The hyper-grace gospel is being preached and taught by false teachers in, and in many false churches called emergent and seeker-friendly churches that teach, now here it is, God will overlook and will not punish willful sin and rebellion, but will always forgive regardless if one repents or not. Now you're going to hear some of this tonight in the video. In other words, the more you sin, the more you're under God's grace and mercy. So it don't matter what you do. As long as you believe in Jesus, hey, if you are living in willful sin, you're still good. Okay? Now, there's a word, there's a passage of scripture, just yeah, give it to this. There's a passage of scripture they hang on. Here it is. This is the passage of scripture, Romans 5.20, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Now, like all false teachers and deceived people, they will take one verse and make a major teaching out of it, taking this one verse out of context. Because if you read all the passage in Romans chapter 5 into Romans chapter 6, you'll know what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about living in sin. In fact, he teaches the opposite. Okay? Yes, somebody had a comment. Yeah, uh, before when you were talking, just before that, there's a scripture uh, that backs that up that uh, it was in John 3.30. John and what? That? John 3.30. He must increase, uh, but I must decrease. Yeah, he's speaking of That's John the what, Baptist. Yeah, 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 and the Lord wants wants to increase and we're supposed to I mean I, I well, believe that's, and that's for all of us that's absolutely um, once you come to know Christ 
every day of your life, Christ ought to be increasing in you, and your old life is passing away. That's what scriptures teach. Our old life is passing away. We're becoming a new creature in Christ. Yes. Yeah. You know, brother, you brought something to my mind. It came, just popped in my mind. Um, and First John 1, 9, we know that it's for the believer. Right. But I heard it recently that they think it's not for the believer, it's for the sinner. That's that, what Joseph Prince teaches. And I knew somebody taught that stuff. But I, but anyway, but how you, I, re, I knew that long before I got, when I got, just got saved, that that was for the believer. It's not for if the If you sinner. read that, though, he says brethren. Yeah, exactly. And how, how in the world they can distort that so because bad? Because we've got to remember, people, just always remember this. Satan's goal is to corrupt. He doesn't care if you have a Bible or go to church as long as you don't have the truth. Because you know as well as I do, you can make scripture say anything you want it to say. Especially if you use one verse. And this is why it's very dangerous to make a teaching out of one verse. If you're going to understand what God is literally saying, you've got to study the scriptures before that and afterward. That's called rightly dividing the word. All right? One of the worst types of preaching and teaching I ever I hear is one, done by people like up here in, in the church of town, you know what I'm talking about, and on, on uh, TBN. They'll use one verse, and they, then they go on a million-mile rabbit trail away from the actual truth of that. This is why we must do expository teaching. Expository preaching teaching means this is what God meant when he said that, in verse by verse, and we rightly divide the word, because you, if you do that, you're going to find other verses that are going to support that teaching. But if you don't find other verses that support that, or are contrary to what you believe, you're deceived. You understand that? This is why we must examine a lot of scriptures. That's, I, I've had people literally think that, boy, that pastor uses a lot of verses. Why did he use all those verses? Because this is not my word I'm preaching. I'm preaching my Heavenly Father's word book. Come on. I'm preaching my Lord's word. I want you to see what his word says. Amen? Amen. All right. So the hyper-grace gospel teaches, and I'm going to give this to you very quickly because this is very important. It teaches that if one accepts Christ as Savior, number one, all past, present, and future sins of the believer have already been forgiven for good. You get that? All of your sins, past, present, and future, no matter what you do, they're under the blood. And God can only see the blood. Now, I understand that. If you truly have repented of your sins, yes, your sins are under the blood. But that does not teach that you're not to continue to, to repent, as we're going to see. Number two, it teaches God does not convict him or her of their sins. If you, the hyper grace gospel teaches that if one accepts Christ as Savior, God no longer convicts him or her of their sins. Because that is judgmentalism. So if a preacher is preaching against sin, people who belong to these churches are going to get upset because they, they oh, you're not helping me. You're making me more sin conscious. They, they call it being coming sin conscious. I don't want to be conscious of my sin. My sin is buried. Several years ago, we had a, a couple in this church. Um, some of you might remember. I don't know if Ron might remember. Um, their, he, their family was coming to church and the guy hated the fact that I preached on holiness, godliness, and righteousness because he kept coming back around that we're under grace, we're under grace, we're under grace. And why you got to talk about sin? And uh, I, I found out who he was listening to. And Joseph Prince was one of his main teachers. And because he believed Joseph Prince, he wasn't about to hear the truth. You've got to understand something else about the hyper-grace gospel. It is married to the word of faith prosperity gospel. Okay. So they're twin. They're twin. They're wicked twins of false doctrines. Number three. Oh, I want to show you this. This is what uh, J Joseph Prince says. Thought I'd add this in there. This is from his book called um, Destined to Reign, on page 180, 134 through 135. The Holy Spirit never convicts you of your sins. He writes, I challenge you to find a scripture in the Bible that tells you that the Holy Spirit has come to convict you of your sins. You won't find any. Well, try John 16, 17, 7, and 8. It teaches very clearly. And when he, the helper, comes, he will convict the world 
concerning sin. Of course, Joseph Prince says, well, that's the sinner. But I got, good, I got news for you. He still convicts us. Okay? And he wants, listen, we're going to learn tonight that God constantly is calling you and I to a life of repentance. And you're not going to repent unless you're convicted. God doesn't want to hurt us. He's trying to help us. Amen. Well, that's what these people do. I know a lot of people that attend these churches. And like I've said, um, I, I wrote about it in my Facebook article today. I have run across people that claim to be Christians that they are no different than those people in the world. They go to the same places. They go to the bars. They listen to the filthy jokes. They watch the, the sin-filled um, movies. Come on. And they don't think anything of it. You know why? Because in their mind, hey, I'm still saved. doesn't matter what I do. Some of these men and women are literally not married. They're living with their boyfriend or girlfriend, and that's okay because, hey, I'm saved by grace. And I, I'm going to prove tonight that is not true. That is not true. All right? So let's go to the next one. Number three, the hyper-grace gospel teaches that if one accepts Christ as Savior, he or she does not need to repent when they knowingly sin. And finally, number four, the hyper-grace gospel teaches that if one accepts Christ as Savior, then addressing sin in their life makes them sin conscience. How dare you preach on sin and make me sin conscience? If you do that, I'm going to leave the church. Well, they have. I've had them walk out of here and run to churches like Meadowbrook and all these other false churches. Yes? You're holier than thou. Oh, if you point out their sins, you're holier than thou? Yes. You know what? I don't have to point out. God points them out pretty clearly. Hey, let me show you something. Let me show you something. So, well, it, it, if, you, if you are proclaiming the truth, see, here's the thing. The Bible says we're not even supposed to be associating with a brother or sister that's living willfully in sin. You know that, right? We're supposed to treat him like a pagan or a tax collector. And not, we're not to be mean to him, but to hope they will repent. You understand? See, I, it, I can hang around an a, a, a unsaved person living in sin. My job is to witness to them. You know, I expect an unsaved person to act like they're not saved. How many know what I'm talking about? But how many of you think we should expect someone who claims to be a Christian to act like they're unsaved? No. So if you're telling me that you're a believer and you don't study God's word, right there tells me you're not a believer. Because a true believer studies God's word. And it's very clear that God wants us to come to the knowledge of truth, the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, to the truth of God's word. But how many of you know in 1 Corinthians chapter, um, let's go there, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to show you something. For those of you who think that God is not going to punish sin, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. How many of you have ever read that? 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Are you there? I want everybody to turn there. Look what Paul writes. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Why would Paul write, do not be deceived, if he's, if, if he's referring only to people that are pagans and unsaved? He would never have said the words, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed now. Now you are washed. See that? But you are sanctified. What's sanctified mean? Separated. You're separated from the sin. You have a new position in Christ. But you are justified. You're declared not guilty in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And by the Spirit of our God. So, hear me, brother and sister. 
God takes sin very seriously, right? All right. So let's go to what are the signs to look at for if you are in a hyper grace go- or if, a, if if what are the signs to look for if to see if a, the hyper grace gospel is being taught. Now these are ten things very quickly. All right. So if you're sitting and you're hearing a preacher preach, these are ten very clear signs that say that man, that preacher, is teaching a false gospel. Number one, the preacher or teacher never speaks out against sin and avoids passages of scripture about sin. Never mentions sin. The word sin does not belong in his vocabulary. And he will avoid scriptures like I just read, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Do you get that? Now, if you don't believe me, watch Joel Osteen. How many times do you ever hear Joel Osteen call, make an altar call for repentance? Never. Same with Joseph Prince. They're not going to. Number two, the preacher or teacher never calls anyone to repentance. If you don't preach on sin, you're certainly not going to preach repentance. Come on. That's an automatic, right? Tell me when you have it. See, I want you to know something. I thank God that I had a pastor who cared enough about me when I was backsliding, came and confronted me. He said, you're blowing it, buddy. And I was. Did you think I wanted to hear that from him? Do you think I was happy? No, I was not happy. But I knew he was telling the truth. Number three, the preacher or teacher only proclaims positive, motivational type messages. Only that which feeds the flesh. Once again, watch Osteen, flesh feeder. Not bringing people to the reality of truth, but stroking the flesh, making them feel good, tickling their ears. Joyce, oh, well, they all do. Myers, Copeland, Duplantis. That's why, listen, here's another thing. You think those people are on television because they're great, wonderful preachers and teachers? I, no, they're on television because Satan put them there. Satan is the god of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. He has them there because he knows he's going to corrupt millions upon millions upon millions of minds through their teaching. There are some good Bible teachers on television. I will, I will be honest about that. There are. Not very many. You know, people like David Wilkerson, they wouldn't have him on television. Or, or Landon Ravenhill. And, if you, and, and I'll be honest with you, you would never hear Donnie Swaggart on TBN. They'd kick him off. They have their own broadcasting. Number four, the pastors, the, when, what are the signs to look for if the hyper-grace gospel is being taught? Number four, the pastor or teachers never take a stand against abortion, homosexuality, or any type of cultural sinfulness. They would never will. In fact, you're going to find they are accepting these things. They are accepting these things. Because part of, of the hyper grace gospel is leading into the social gospel. Which we're going to look at next, or two, two sun, Wednesday nights from two Wednesday nights. The social gospel. Now, you, you know, just in case you, 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 you don't get all this, you can go back and watch it later, okay? I'm, Number five, there is no mention of the Ten Commandments. That is taboo. No Ten Commandments in the Old Testament is almost completely ignored unless using some stories as examples. We cannot mention the Ten ten, uh, Commandments because we're no longer on the commandments. And I heard a preacher literally say that we're no longer on the law. The Ten Commandments are gone. That's right, it doesn't. But you know why? But this is what makes the decision. People want to hear that. Imagine saying, you mean to tell me I can live in sin and I'm not breaking any commandments because it's under the blood? Yeah, wow. Okay, I'm going to praise Jesus now in church. Then after that, I'm going to the bar and find myself a woman. (laughs) That's right. Most of us about money. And these pastors that preach this are getting crowds. They start a church with a few people. In a matter of a year, they'll have 100, 200 people. And that's right here in Ocala, Florida. And believe me, uh, brother, if I was to preach this gospel, 
I guarantee you, a year from now, we'd have, a brand, we'd have to build a new building because it tickles the ears. See, we've had people come here thinking that this church is more like a word of faith because abundant life, well, that has to mean abundance of something, right? Abundance of money, abundance of wealth, abundance of material. But in reality, what abundant life means from John 10.10, 10, it literally means the abundance of fruit. Abundance of walking with Christ, producing Holy Spirit fruit. Once they find out we don't teach that gospel, they're gone. And I've had them come and go. Only people who really want to endure the truth will stay with us. Okay? Number six, they will, not, they will allow people who are living immoral lives or living willfully in sin to minister in the church. And that happens all the time. It's like the guy up there in New York. Once again, I forget his name. Carl, Carl Lentz, having affairs, preaching the gospel. Um, what was his name down here in Lakeland? Todd Bentley. Cheating on his wife with his, with his secretary in a motel in Lakeland, Florida. All the, these revival meetings are going on. Not only that, but drinking, getting drunk out of his skull. He's part of this. But that's okay. Hey, you know what? I'm under God's grace. Hyper grace. Hyper grace now. Not God's grace. Hyper grace. Number seven. There is very little mention of the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. They won't talk about the cross. Or the blood. Now, once again, just listen to people like Osteen and Joseph Prince, Joyce Myers. Now, occasionally they'll talk about it, but I'm going to tell you something. This is the main, got to be the main teaching of the church: the cross and the blood. Come on, right? Number eight: there is no call to holiness, righteousness, and godliness. That is out. There is no call. There is no saying this is what God wants. You, how God wants you to live. See, what's the difference between holiness, righteousness, and godliness? Holiness is what takes place first in your life. It's called sanctification. So if you, see, you don't have to be really schooled in God's word to be holy. How many know that? You were kind of like that anyway but when you were a child. Think about it. When you were a child, did you go, did you go looking for watching uh, filthy movies? Or did you use vulgar language? No, as a little child, you, 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 know, you were innocent. You didn't want to watch that stuff. You didn't want to watch stuff that was evil or wicked. It's when you got older. Basically, what holiness means is that I know that I'm a believer in Christ now, and I don't want anything to do with the world. I may not know all the verses in the Bible, but I know God doesn't want me to have anything to do with the world. So I separate myself from the world. The second thing that happens is righteousness is being instilled in you. The righteousness is what comes from God's word because God's word is right. So what is it? Righteousness is that which is right in the eyes of God. And the more of the righteous word of God gets in you, Christ declares you righteous, and then you be, begin to be righteous. What does righteousness produce? Godliness. What's godliness? That's the fruit of the Spirit. Godly character. And that's growing. Do you see? But they're not going to talk about these things. They're not going to talk about these things. Because it's all... Taboo to them because, hey, we're under grace or hyper grace. Number nine, there's very little teaching on discipleship and the fruit of the Spirit. What's discipleship? We don't have to follow Jesus. Man, all you have to do is just believe in Jesus. And finally, number 10, there is no mention or teaching on God's coming wrath or judgment of hell. Hell does not exist in these churches. There, if, and listen, if you are saved, once saved, and you don't have, and you're, you're, all your sins, past, present, future, are under the blood, why even mention hell? And why mention, there's nothing. They don't like talk about the, the God's coming wrath on this earth during the tribulation. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We're under God's judgment right now in America. Do you, do you want me to give you God's, what, one of God's main judgments on us right now? I'm going to tell you what God's main judgment is on America right now. You want me to tell what it is? False prophets and teachers. The reason why we have false prophets and teachers growing in America is because the church has spit in the face of God. We've allowed them to come. Now, I'm not saying all churches, but the vast majority of churches, they want this kind of teaching. Just like homosexuality, homosexuality is a judgment. I've heard people say, you know, 
boy, the, the, we're allowing this homosexual marriage to go on in our country. That's, that's going to bring God's judgment. That is God's judgment. That is God's judgment. Because America just keeps going deeper and deeper in the cesspool of sinfulness. And that's why we got transgender type things going on. You know, little Johnny gets to choose what sex he is at in his kindergarten. What sex do you want to be, Johnny? How about you, little Susie? What do you want to be? That's not going to lead to God's judgment. That is God's judgment. Are you hearing me? All right. So here's a, here's a warning, biblical warning. Sugar-coated preaching is dangerous to your soul. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, King James Version says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. This is why people watch Joel Osteen by the millions, and Joseph Prince, and Kenneth Copeland, and Jesse Duplantis, and all of them, Joey Myers, Stephen Furtnick, and all of them. Because they do not want to hear the true word of God, so they are going to look to hear whatever makes them happy. But after their own what? After their own lust, what's that mean? According to their own lust, their own sinful desires, they are going to heap up for themselves teachers. So I'm going to find teachers and preachers and pastors that are going to feed my sinful nature. Tell me what makes me feel good. So if I want to be sleeping around, I want to be able to told that's okay. If I want to be involved in a homosexual relationship, I want to be told that's okay. If I want to be shooting drugs up or doing whatever, whatever makes me feel good, I want to be able to told I can still do that and have eternal life. And you know what? There are a lot of preachers out there that will do that for you. Just come to my church, and I will tell you you're okay. And I know some pastors like that. And they, they despise preachers like yours truly. They, they, you know what they call us? They call us legalistic. They call us Pharisees because we call people to repentance and to live holy and righteous in God. Yes, sir. You know, and they reward people like that very handsomely. You know that. Oh, yeah. They make good money. Yes, they do. And, you know, it reminded me of a scripture that Brother Donnie brought out, and I, I love this. And it's in Jude chapter, uh, Jude verse 11. Why don't we all turn to Jude 11? Yeah, it's a small it's, book. This, this Jude was a half-brother of Jesus, we, right. we know. It's right so. after the, the right. third, third John. Well, I, I want you to see what you're, uh, this really hits the nail on the head here. Uh, verse 11, you there, there? Yeah. It says, Woe to them, they for have gone the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. Yes. Yeah, that's what Balaam did in the Old Testament. You know, when he, Balak, the, the son of Beor, tried to get him to, uh, to pronounce a curse on the Israelites when they're entering the Promised Land. You remember that? Yes, right. In the book of Numbers. And, uh, he, and of course, Balaam couldn't do it, but he would, he was, he want, they would reward him very handsomely. Do you understand that? Right, right. And so uh, it's like these guys here, people are just a commodity to them. Money's more important to them than the people oh, itself. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, and so they just go on the way of Balaam. And, and I've been asked by uh, some people and said, "Do these false teachers know what they're really doing, or are they deceived?" And I used to think, "Oh, they're deceived," but not anymore. I believe they know exactly what they're doing. Right. They know exactly what they're doing. They know that what they're doing is going to get money because you got to remember they're not saved. A saved person will never use people to get for sale. They are living for this life, and they want nothing more than power and prestige and money. They want large churches. They want it's all about them. So they know exactly what they're doing, because many of them have been, been confronted. Copeland has been confronted many times and, and told either repent or you're going to perish. And he just laughs at him, said, "Who are you? Look what I have. Look what you got." So it's always about who has the most toys. You know the old saying, "Whoever dies with the most toys wins." Well, not for him. He's not going to win anything but eternal damnation and hell, and along with thousands of others. Yes. Pastor, don't you think that the, the pastors that are preaching that false doctrine are going to be even more accountable to God because oh. they're leading all the sheep <laughs> Let me tell in you the wrong something. direction? Let me tell you something, sister. This is what concerns me. I've got to be very careful because I am going to be held at a much stricter judgment. Than, than, the, than the people that yes, you're, yeah, because you're preaching. Yes, because what I say could mislead someone away from Christ. 
and I am not going to mislead people. That's why I'm, I've got to preach and teach the truth. Even if people, listen, I'm going to say something. I was telling, you know, um, some people on Sunday that, you know, we, we lost some wonderful people here and moved away. And it hurts because a, a smaller church is we need people. But even if I only have to have a few people here, and that's all who wants to come and hear the truth, that so be it. Yeah. Because I am not going to change teaching to something that's going to entertain people so I can get them to come. Because I am not going to have that severe judgment put on me. You understand? Yes. I've got to tell the truth. Yeah. The last part of verse 4, uh, uh, this passage, 2 Timothy 4, 4 says, And they shall turn aw their, away their ears from the truth, mm -hmm. and shall be turned unto fables. Now you're going to find uh, what Joseph Prince teaches his fables. We're going to watch this video. This is, oh, he's so a fable, and you got a comment? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. this is a short one. Go ahead. Um, I just find that when, when uh, Bob and I have gone to these other churches to try them out, is that the church conforms to the people. The, the people are, are hungry for that validation from something. So they love that church because it tells them they can live their lifestyle. They can do what they want. The difference with the true gospel is that it creates a relationship with God that, that sanctifies you and transforms you into this love relationship. Absolutely. Where you do not want to hurt God, you no, want to you don't be want to like dishonor him. Yes, you don't want to dishonor him. So it's so it's me conforming to God yeah. rather than the church conforming to me. Amen. Yeah. And that's so good. Thank you for that. All right, this video is about six and a half minutes long, but it says it all. Now, if I used every video on the Hyper Grace, it would take us a, a month or better. Um, there's just hundreds of them, but Joseph Prince seems to be the leader in this group. And uh, he teaches a false form of repentance. They all, they all do. And you've got to remember, these, these individuals, all of them, Prince, Joel Osteen, Duplantis, all of them, they don't know their Bible. They have, they have no clue what truth is. They know how to take Scripture and make it say something to get you, twisting Scripture, to make you believe something to get from you. And this is what he's done. His book called um, Born to Reign or whatever it is, that book has sold millions of copies and people who believe that because of God's hyper grace, no matter what, God's going to put us at the highest level, are not only deceived, but they are going to literally find out one day before it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. And I wouldn't want to be Mr. Prince's shoes what he's done to mislead people. Okay, let's watch this. What's happening, Polite Society? I hope you had a good week. Shout out to F15 who suggested the subject for this week's video. Joseph Prince is a famous religious teacher and author. Prince has been a leading voice in televangelism and instructional literature for more than two decades now. But there are a couple of disturbing aspects to the global leader's theology which I'll be taking a look at coming up. Alright, let's delve in. Joseph Prince is a founding member of New Creation Church. Initially, Mr. Prince served as an elder and associate teacher. But after his appointment to senior teacher in 1990, the organization experienced phenomenal growth and went from 150 attendees to over 30,000. Additionally, his broadcast has reached millions across the globe. The two primary problems with Joseph Prince's theology are his hyper-grace teachings and his prosperity gospel leanings. Joseph Prince is also the best-selling author of several books. One of these, titled Destined to Reign, is riddled with errors. For instance, on page 106, to get around 1 John 1, which speaks of confessing sins, he claims this chapter is written to Gnostics only, but the rest of 1 John is written to Christians. He asserts that Romans 10.17, which discusses faith coming from hearing, only applies to the New Testament. 
But Paul clearly believes that the Old Testament can make us wise unto salvation, as he expresses in 2 Timothy 3.15. Prince produces a completely new and fanciful idea about Revelation 3. He states that the command of the Laodiceans to be neither hot nor cold, but not lukewarm in that chapter, refers to not mixing old and new covenants. Obviously, this is an indefensible interpretation of Revelation chapter 3. On page 121, he shockingly tells us that ministers should not even preach the Ten Commandments because doing so will lead believers to sickness and depression. But the New Testament writers all recognize that obeying the Decalogue out of love and gratitude to the Savior displays clear evidence of saving faith. There are many, many other errors in this book which I could go over. If you listen to any of Prince's messages or read any of his books, he clearly has an unhealthy antagonism towards the Old Testament and an imbalanced and selective interpretation of the New. Prince does not understand the Old Testament, and he fails to see the nuances of understanding the law in the Bible. Joseph Prince is also loath to exhort his audience to repent. In fact, he even avoids using the term repentance. To do this, but you're getting the same kind of response, aren't you? People... Yes need and and want you know the word repentance uh, like Joel said is from the Greek word metanoia which literally means change your mind and uh, every time like Joel or, or me preaching the word without using the word repentance sometimes but people's minds are being changed all the time mm-hmm. from thinking this way negatively to thinking positively well Joseph Prince says that uh, the Greek word for repentance is metanoia you know what He's right. And then he says that the word metanoia means to change your mind. You know what? Right again. But then did you notice how he fleshed it out? He said we may not be using the word repentance. You know, let's not confuse anybody with theological terms that the Bible uses. So we may not be using that term, but we're teaching people to repent all of the time. When people go from thinking negatively to thinking positively. Friends, that's not repentance. By his definition of repentance, we could all repent simply by joining the Optimist Club. (laughs) Having a sunnier outlook on life. That's not repentance. Genuine repentance is a change in mind, but it comes when God's Holy Spirit grants repentance. He gives us a godly sorrow over our sin, And when he grants us repentance, there is evidence of that. There is fruit of that. And that will be evident to other people around us. There will be deeds. Paul says, So, King Agrippa, I kept declaring that all people should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. John the Baptist, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Does this mean we do good deeds in order to repent? No. But when God grants repentance, deeds, fruit, will be a natural outflow of that. It is a change in mind, but it's a change in mind that results in a changed life. Live to the glory of God. As demonstrated in this clip, Joseph Prince is a strong supporter of Joel Osteen. Olstein is a false teacher, and his heretical word of faith doctrines have been criticized by solid church leaders for many years now. In conclusion, Joseph Prince has an incredibly imbalanced theology, and as a result, he certainly strays towards cheap grace. Although he rejects that charge, his complete lack of desire to teach on the New Testament's ethical demands in our lives says otherwise. While Mr. Prince prides himself as an apt interpreter of scripture, he is actually far from it. His simplistic, selective, imbalanced, ignorant, and to be honest, deceptive interpretation of scripture clearly endangers his listeners and readers. Any believer who is thinking about listening to Joseph should definitely proceed with utmost caution. Ladies and gents, if you have your own thoughts, be sure to leave them in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like that video, please give it a thumbs up. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so any comments on that? I know most of you in this church know that Joseph Prince is a false teacher. Um, But once again, you see how they get all the notoriety on television, on the Satan wants them there. And if you don't know your Bible, if you don't know what the true gospel is, you're going to listen to people like Joseph Prince. And you're going to hate churches like ours 
because you think that we're being too legalistic or we're being too harsh because we say if you're truly saved, you're going to live like you're going to, you're going to live holy and righteous and godly. Okay, because like uh, Justin Peter says, God grants us repentance. And repentance leads, you know, God, what is repentance? It's godly sorrow. It's not fleshly sorrow, it's godly sorrow. But godly sorrow that leads to repentance always is going to lead to a fruitful life. Yes? Yeah, I, I, I was surprised about that. I, I hear a lot about don't listen to negative thinking, but listen to positive thinking. And that's what he was talking about. He's like, positive thinking leads to repentance, and it doesn't. It's That's absolutely not repentance. Yeah, yeah, I know. And that, that was something that I, I've heard that. It's from a change of mind. Just like he's right, yeah. it's a change of mind. But what is a change, change of mind? The change of mind is we are changing our way of thinking to God's way of thinking. Right. So concerning sin, we're going to change our mind. Say, before we would practice sin, and thinking that's fine, I'll do whatever I want. But, but now we know it's wrong. We know that it, it, it dishonors God. And we want to not stop doing it because we are sorry that we have, really, we have offended a thrice holy God, right? But a we, lot of people will say, if you say something negative, Satan hears that. Oh, okay. Now, that's see, not true. And Satan is not all knowing like God. No, I don't so know who t says that, but that. that's, that's just, that's, yeah, a, heard that's that, way on la la land. Yeah. Uh, okay. That. So. You know, keeping a positive outlook on life, sure. I mean, you know, you don't want to be down and, on, and gloomy and, 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 you know, but, it, but see, here's the thing. So if a, if a pastor gets up and, and preaches and says, listen, homosexuality is sin. It's going to keep you out of heaven. Is that negative? It, it will be negative if you want to live in sin. Uh, if, sex, if I say sexual immorality, fornication, adultery, any sexual immorality, because God's word clearly teaches this, is sin, and anyone who lives like that cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Is that negative? No, it's very positive, because it's truth. It's only negative to people who do not want to repent. Okay? Right, so if you, if, you are, if you are siding with your flesh, yeah, it's going to be negative. But if you're siding with the spirit, because God's granting you repentance, you're going to repent. Yes, do you have a comment? Um, okay, so I, before I forget what I was going to say. Um, so legalism is a sin, too. But, but, but before I say that, let me just say this. There's a lot of people that follow the law that are not good people. They no. don't believe in a higher power. They just are coward. They're afraid to get in trouble and mm -hmm. go to jail. So they just do what's right, not because they believe in any higher mm -hmm. power so then you have people who are legalists who are oh my, i gotta be that's why it's n narrow <laughs> what's the what's the difference between legalism and righteousness well you can't be right only god can make you right i mean you could i'm not making excuses mm -hmm. but i'm saying there is a a place where you go too far where you think you're going to be righteous in the eyes of God, when you look but down no, at other people. What is true biblical righteousness compared to legalism? To me, righteousness is keeping the law. But, but we fail all the time to keep the whole law. I mean, it's like, think about it like this. The world wants peace without righteousness. If they had kept the law, they yeah. will have peace. Right. But Let me give you an I'm example. Look at, the, look at the Pharisees. Yeah. Were, were they legal? They were wrong. They were legalistic. Why? Because they were putting demands on people to follow their way of religion, yeah. and yet they were hypocrites. Obviously, they were hypocrites. But righteousness that Christ gives us is not what you and I do. It's what the Holy Spirit does in us, and that's the difference. See? Jesus had a lot of rebuke for the righteous holy people who were not they weren't how do I explain it he had a lot of rebuke for them and he said many times in different parables he said uh you know which one is righteous I told my son and now I'm paraphrasing this isn't mm -hmm. you know but he says if I told my son go work out in the field and he says no I will not but then he turns and he does but then I say to the one go work in my field mm -hmm. and he said I will and then he goes away and doesn't right 
And then he has the parable of the people who he invited to the feast that right. were too good to come. And right. then he said, go out right. in the streets. So yeah, I see what you're coming, but let's go back to what I was saying. What, how is righteousness really produced in us? Is it our good works? No. No, right. Man can't be See, good. the difference between legalism is <laughs> man's can't. works that promotes man's ways compared to what God is doing in us through the Holy Spirit who produces Holy Spirit fruit. See, this is why the righteousness that's in you and I is not ours. It's his. Yeah, but if you rebuke pride, then you have to rebuke well, we, it we have religious got to pride. Always, we've got to always deal with our pride because pride is going to cause us to sin, and God will humble us if we don't. Yeah. All right. All right that's a good comment, and I appreciate it. So looking at um, Joe Osteen and... Joseph Prince, you can see this picture, faithful Bible preaching compared to ear tickling. Now you know why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Narrow is the gate, difficult is the way that leadeth to life. Why? Because, see, the difference is if you want to basically just follow your flesh, there are a lot of teachers out there that will tell you you can do that. But that's not God's way. Now let's look at this. Why is the hyper-grace gospel false and da very dangerous? Number one, and we're going to have to come back and revisit this, okay? We can't get through all this tonight. Because God's word clearly teaches us that repentance is mandatory in order to receive God's forgiveness in order to be saved. Not just one-time repentance, but a continual repentance. Do you understand this? Now, it, I looked up every scripture that has to do with continual repentance, and I found like 80, 80 verses just in the New Testament. I'm not going to give you all 80, but I'm going to give you a few. Let's start off with the most appropriate one, but I want to show you this. A gospel that does not confront sin isn't the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because remember what the true gospel does. It shows that we are depraved sinners, Right? It shows us that we can't save ourselves. I get that. But it also calls us to repentance. Part of our faith in what Christ did on the cross is to know what God's word says we must do to receive Christ. Okay, now look at this. Mark 1, 15. And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. What's the first thing we need to do is repent before you can believe. We find out Peter said the same thing. He didn't say believe on Jesus Christ and repent. He said repent and believe. Repent and believe. How many see that? So is repentance important? You better believe it. Let's look at another passage. Acts 2. This is the passage of Scripture where Peter just preached... A powerful gospel message came out of the upper room. Remember that? And everybody was saying, look, at they're all drunk because they were speaking in other languages. And um, Peter said, no, no, no. He said, this is not because we've been drinking. It's only the third hour. Here's why. Here's why. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he preached a powerful gospel message. And when he got done, he said, this is what you did to Jesus. You crucified him. And the Holy Spirit working in that message, working through Peter's words, convicted their hearts. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to their heart. That's conviction. That's what conviction does. It convicts us. It cuts us to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now... If Peter would be around today and follow all the false teachers, he'd say, listen, buy my books. <laughs> Sow your seed faith into my ministry. Wouldn't he? But he didn't. What did he say? Repent. First words out of his mouth. Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look what Jesus said in Luke 13, 3. Likewise, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. 
Here's another one, 2 Corinthians 7.10. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation not to be regretted. Godly sorrow. But the sorrow of the world produces death. What's the difference? That's right. The difference between godly sorrow is God gives you godly sorrow. He grants you repentance because you are sorry that you have committed sins against a thrice holy God. You can't be saved without this, folks. I don't care how much you believe in Jesus. You know that you have committed sins against a thrice holy God and you have, and, and the Lord God has every right to cast you and I into hell. But you are sorry because you didn't, not because you got caught. You're sorry because you know you're a sinner. You're sorry that you have offended God. The world's sorry is I got caught. My pride is hurt. I feel bad for me. I'm feeling sorry for myself. I got caught. It's like, you know, when you catch your kids doing something they shouldn't do. <laughs> I won't do it again, I promise. And then in mind it says, I'll get, if I get away from it, with it, I'll do it again. But I know what I was like when I was a kid. But, all right. Somebody had a comment. Brother, uh, over here, we got a couple. And we're going to pick this up next time because I've, yeah. I was just uh, going to bring up John 16, 8. Let's go to John's Gospel, chapter 16, and then verse 8. So it says, when he comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, yes. he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin. Yes. And, and not only that, but of righteousness. And righteousness and judgment mm -hmm. in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. But if anything, that this here is saying that the Holy Spirit does convict us Absolutely. of sin all the time. Absolutely, because yes. God loves us. Yes. The Bible says, to whom God loves, he chastens. And you know, when God would, could never chasten us unless we were convicted. What would, be, what would be the purpose of God disciplining us if we said, what did I do? No, instead, the Holy Spirit convicts. I know why God is chastening me or punishing me. Yes. You know, brother, I was thinking that scripture, that last part, rather, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Right. And that's nothing more than being. That's just nothing more than being remorseful. Right. And, and which it all. And there's a big difference between being a remorse and re, and repentance. Yeah. And, and the, what what is the difference? Tell us. Well, I can give you an example. Uh, mm -hmm. Peter, when the night he betrayed, uh, he denied Christ the three times. He was he was regret he, which led him to regret the weeping the weeping led him to regret but you took judas he didn't repent no he was remorseful yeah and so that just leads to the re regret repent. um changes you you don't you you don't, a change of heart a change of repentance is what yeah. i'm saying a change mm -hmm. of heart whereas being remorseful also just all it leads to is despair Right, and, and yeah. th this is why people today who truly are saved are going to see a life change because they, they have that true godly sorrow, yeah. all right? And that's why the Holy Spirit works in the life of a, of a true believer. But the false convert, they may go to church all they want, but they're going to live just like the world. They're not going to have a change. 1 John 1, 8, 9. This is the verse that Joseph Prince says is not written to the church but written to the pagan world this is ridiculous John says if we we the church say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if John was referring to the pagan world first John 1 8 9 if John was referring to the pagan world he would have said if they say they have no sin but he says, if we, he's referring to the church, he's referring to the body of Christ or the believer, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And by the way, if the truth is not in you, are you saved? Absolutely not. This is why these men in, can teach these false teachings and, and, and just do it with, with the drop of the hat thing, nothing of it. The truth is not in them. I would be literally scared out of my brain 
Because, man, what did I, ta- what did I just say? I mean, it's like the other night I was watching Todd White um, say some, something worse than he said the last time I seen a video that literally said this, and you can look it up. He said that when, if, if a, a man is sinning, having, having an, a fornication or adultery against his wife, God's right there with him in bed. You can look it up. But he says because God is with us all the time, he's right there watching us. And yet God still loves us. No, that, that God knows the sin, of course, but he doesn't join us in it. And he's certainly not happy. He's angry. This is why people, and yet, like I said, here we got this man who's got thousands of followers. Uh, you know, why would anybody want to follow somebody like Todd White or Cat Kerr, who the pink hair and the weather warrior, or Robin Bullock, who's ne- who doesn't have a clue what the Bible says, and wh- these people, why do they follow him? Because p- most of the world, these people, these, they're not saved. These people, you cannot, you will not follow somebody like that if you're truly saved. Yes, Sister Jesse. Right. They're not in the Word. They, well, they can't. They, no. they don't, they're not, they're not. And, and if we go to one, um, Psalm 119, 105, it says, your, your Word is lamp. To my light. feet and mm. light to my path. Yes. And when it says word, it's not just the New Testament. That's no, it's all, all of God's, God's word. word. Right. Yeah, and you got to go back to, remember, Prince said that the Old Testament's not for us. Well, doesn't the word of God say all scripture? All scripture. And when Paul wrote that, there was not much of a New Testament. There were letters being passed around. But he's referring to the Old Testament. you got to remember that. Okay. There wasn't, they didn't have a New Testament Bible. All right, so verse 9, if we confess our sins. So if we uh, are not to repent of our sins, then why does John say we are to confess our sins? If we confess our sins, when? Every time we sin. If we confess our sins, he, that's Christ, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But look at verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him to be a what? A liar, and his word's not in us. Look at this. Galatians 5.24. We're going to stop after this first point, and we're going to pray. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have what? Crucified Crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. What is that? It means put to death, but how do we put to death? How do we quit? We repent. You cannot crucify the flesh unless you repent of the sins. Well, how are you going to repent of the sins if you're not convicted of them? Repentance is death to sin, life to obedience. That's it. God grants you repentance. You put to death to sin by repenting. You change your mind. You're heading in this direction. You're going against God's will, God's word. You change and you go with God's word. You get it? Now, we're going to close on this one, but how many know um, the lukewarm church of Laodicea? That is what the hyper-grace church represents today. Now, we'll pick this up in the next two weeks. But Jesus is knocking on the door of the church. Now, how many have ever seen the picture of Jesus knocking on the door? And I have seen that on people's walls say, Jesus is just waiting for you to let him into your heart. That's not what that verse means. It means Jesus has been kicked out. He's been put out of the church. So what's Jesus say to the unfaithful, lukewarm, hyper-grace, prosperity, seeker-friendly church, because that's what the lukewarm Laodicean church age represents. He, he, he says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. I rebuke. If you are being rebuked, you're going to be convicted. So be earnest and what? Repent. Repent. He says, here I am. I'm standing at the door of the church or the heart of the church. 
and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice, anyone hears the truth in my word, that's what he means. If anyone hears my voice to repent, here's the word, repent, and opens the door of their heart, I will come in and eat with him and that person with me. In conclusion tonight, we'll pick this up in two weeks. If the gospel you preach doesn't include repentance, you preach a false gospel. People who do not want to hear the word repentance don't know Jesus. People who do not want to stop sinning and believe they can live in sin all they want do not know him. They're not saved. Because every true believer wants to honor God. We're going to get to the part. A true believer wants to be the light. As Jesus said, we are to be light. How can you glorify God if you are living willfully in sin? How can you do the work of the Lord if you're living willfully in sin? I mean, I get it today how many of these guys, they just, they live in sin and their followers say, what, no big deal. No big deal. I mean, they're saved by grace and, and I'm here to tell you, no, they're not. They're not saved by grace. Because Romans chapter 6 verse 1 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? And God's word says, God forbid. Let it not be. How can we who are dead to sin live in it any longer? You see, brother and sister, if we are truly saved, we are dead to sin. We have been buried with Christ. That's why the word of God says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ Jesus, what's, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. They're passing away. Our old life is passing away. The new life has come. They're a new creature in Christ. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not I who liveth, but it's Christ who liveth in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That, my friend, is what true repentance produces. A new life. Amen. Any questions before we go? Yes, go ahead. No, no, we're, we, got, we got a few minutes. You know, I was looking at that picture of Jesus knocking on the door. Uh-huh. You know. And uh, the Bible says he's the true door. Right. And, but the, the ch modern church has erected another door, which tells me they're going to let the back door, another door, another, uh, there's another door other than the, the, the true door that you can go in and that's another way of salvation. Am I right? I yeah, mean, they're producing of course. another way. There's a false salvation. Okay. They're, they're, all, they're, all, they're entering, they're allowing these false Christ, false teachers, and everybody else come in. They're that, um, that well, other door. Do you door. know what one of the biggest false gospels that's being taught today is Pope Francis is promoting ecumenicalism. Yeah. That doesn't matter what you believe. You can be an atheist uh -huh. and God's going to let you into heaven. Yeah. This is how, no wonder Jesus warned. He said, listen, I want you to know something. He's telling his disciples, the apostles. He said, listen, I want you to know. They said, they, they, they said to him, Jesus, what are the signs of your coming? What will be the sign at the end of the age? He said, first thing, watch out for false prophets and teachers yeah. because they're going to come and deceive many. Boy, are they here now. You know, I, I saw something on news today, and it, I was, uh, anyway, it was talking about the, uh, the Catholic bishops now, uh, because of the president's stand on abortion, mm -hmm. that they allow him to take communion. They go ahead and compromise that, whereas before, and I thought that was very astounding. I mean, I, I knew it was going to happen anyway. Oh, of course. They, they'll compromise, but anyway, there was a firm, they used to stand on something, you know, at least for that, but they, they soon compromise that and allow him to take communion thinking, well, he thinks that's going to save him, but that's a bunch of baloney. No. Anyway, no. but, uh, well, that people have faith in that stuff, too. Believe me, they do. They believe that taking communion is going, I'm going to save now. Well, and think. did you notice that the, the word of faith, right. N-E-R, the hyper-grace people, that they're, like I said, they're all in cahoots with Roman Catholicism. Yeah. It's all part of the, this is, this is the last days, uh, let me put it this way, this is the, um, the one world religion that's being formed. Yeah. 
And it's, it's just welcoming everything that is contrary to God's word in. And the only thing they don't want is true biblical evangelical Christianity like we preach. Right. They don't want us because we're the troublemakers. You know, and, and, you know, because we believe in things like the rapture, boy, I've come under attack big time, you know, rapture teaching. And I'm going to tell you, so, uh, or, you know, so I'm telling you, the Antichrist spirit is out there and it's growing by leaps and bounds. All right. Anybody else besides Ken tonight? Victoria. Well, no, this is what we want to do. Now, hopefully next time we meet on Wednesday night, we'll be over in the Ed Center. We'll have a, a whole new setup over there. David Jockel's getting it done for us, doing a great job. Okay, I found it. The parable of the two sons. Oh, one. yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll it says... What, what, where, where's that at? Uh, Matthew 21, 28. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first one and said, Son, go and work it today in my vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. No, what Which, was that, Matthew 21 what? 21, uh, 28. 28, okay. Sorry. And he said, I, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did his father's will? So I think this is like pharisee and then you it know is. what i mean yeah, it represents the pharisees yeah so you know we can't always look at people and say well you're not you know because you don't you don't know who god has you know what i mean you can you don't want to hang out with people who are dead like not right. unsaved but you don't know who god has saved or changed or turned you know what, what i'm saying what is the one true sign of a believer from john's death gospel chapter self. 15 death Death to self. Death to self, and what else? Repentance. And what does that produce? Fruit. The fruit. Yeah. John 15 clearly teaches that. Jesus said, if you abide in me, and I abide in you, you will produce much fruit to the glory of the Father. Right. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. And what all, all that means is a transformed life. What I'm saying is we have to be humble, because then we won't help people who, to, Oh, you know of course, saying? of course, we got it. We, you know, we're not going to help anybody by condemning them. But at the same time, we can't go to the point where we're, uh, you know, condoning people things because, boy, you know what? I don't want to offend someone. Okay, condemning is coming down on. But the most hateful thing you can do to someone who's in like the Word of Faith, Hyper Grace, New Apostolic Reformation, Roman Catholicism, is to make them believe that they're okay because they believe in Jesus. That is hateful, my friend. You're not helping them by saying, well, that's nice you go to church. Well, that's great that you go to that big church and bad, you know. No, no, you need to say, listen, I want to show you what the true gospel is. And if you truly believe the true gospel, you're not going to follow anything that's false. I have done this with my own Catholic family. Did they like it? No. I, one, my own nephew was close to me, just hates me, despises me. Because I told him, I said, you, he at one time was going to a Baptist church, literally getting some truth, good truth. But because my brother passed away, he was Catholic, he decided he was going to honor his dad, and basically it's like a dog returning to his vomit. And I said, man, you're making the biggest mistake you've ever made. And, of course, he got angry with me, and I said, I'm going to tell you, there is no truth in Roman Catholicism. All right? You can't, no Roman Catholic can be, now you can be a, a Catholic and be saved for a while. Because you're, you know, you're eventually going to come out of it, though. You're not going to stay in it. It's like you can be in the word of faith and be saved, but you're going to come out of it. But if you remain in it, is the truth of God's word in you? Here's the question I'm going to leave you with. Will God honor our disobedience to his word just because we're deceived? No. God will only honor his word. So if we think God's going to honor our deception, because you know what? I believe this way, God. And even if people have come, true believers have come and have corrected that or rebuked that or refuted that, and you sit there and say, no, I want to believe that way because I believe God is love, God is merciful, so it doesn't matter what I believe. Is God going to honor that because you believe God is love and God is merciful? 
Absolutely not. Right. God will only honor his word. Now, there are things that you and I, uh, with other believers, are not going to agree on that are not have anything to do with salvation. Like, for instance, we are pre-tribulation rapture. And I know I have a brother in the Lord who is post-trib to the max, and he and I disagree on that. But he's born again. He's saved. Where, where you are at on concerning the rapture is not going to keep you out of heaven. Or uh, who wrote the book of Hebrews? So I'm a firm, convinced, I believe Paul wrote it. Sounds like Paul to me. Can I prove it? Can I? No, I can't prove it. Other people think Luke wrote it. There are some other writers. It doesn't matter? No. There are things we can agree on and disagree on, but when it comes to salvation, when it comes to the gospel, we cannot. So if the church is not treat, teaching true biblical salvation, if they're not teaching, right, as we talked about, if they're teaching these false gospels, like the prosperity gospel or the hyper-faith gospel, you and I cannot have fellowship with them because they are not in fellowship. They are outside God's will. They're lost. Our only thing we can do is witness to them and proclaim the true gospel. Warn them. Warn them. Warn them with all your heart, please. They're on a sinking ship. They're like, it's like the Titanic. They're going down. They may be sailing fine now, but it's going to go down. All right, do you understand? Our, our job, and, and I, they're, yeah, they're going to get mad. They're going to get upset. Remember, our job is not to get people like us. Our job is to proclaim the gospel hope, with the hope that they come to the light and get saved. So if you've got friends, you've got family in this, you've got to warn them. I've warned my own family. Because I don't want their blood on my hands one second into eternity. I would rather have them hate me and not talk to me ever again than to get them to like me knowing that I am literally condoning something that's going to send them right into hell. All right? So with that, let's pray because I think that's a good thing to pray about right now. Are you ready? Heavenly Father, we learned tonight once again that your word is true and your word declares very clearly what the true gospel is. It's all about Jesus and him crucified. It's all about what you did on the cross for us, Lord. And it's not about any of our works. And you didn't come to make our life better. You came to save us. If there's anything you do in our life, Lord, it's the transformation that you do when we receive the truth of your word. And that is not for our glory. It's for yours. Anything you do through us, Lord, it's about you helping us so that we can declare with our own mouths the true gospel witnesses for your glory and father if we have family or friends that are involved in false religions such as roman catholicism or jehovah witnesses or mormons or attending a word of faith um, false movement or new apostolic reformation or any of these things hyper grace any of these things lord help us to realize that our family and our friends are, are deceived and are lost and we need to lead them down to that, that narrow gate so that they may enter in and follow you, follow the truth of your word. Now, Lord, we ask your blessing upon uh, the rest of our week and bring us back safely on Sunday if you should tarry. We pray for Sister Jennifer who's going to come and minister. We pray that, Lord, you would use her for your glory this coming Sunday. We pray for the presentation over in the Ed Center concerning the DNA of the Nephilim. Lord, teach us and lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you for being here tonight. We did get done early. I just, we talked a little longer. So.